Hello and welcome to the Faith and Reason podcast on Paving the Way Home. Today we're delighted to be joined by Father Colum Mannion again up in uh, up in Tala. So welcome, Father Colum. Hello, Kevin. Thanks for having me back again. Uh, it's great to have you back. So uh, yeah, we're in we're in lockdown again. Were we in lockdown last time that we spoke? Uh, I think we were. It was right at the beginning of the lockdown. I think um, the first time we spoke. So. Uh, yeah, hard to believe almost a year ago. Absolutely, yeah. It's mad, mad, yeah. How, how are you finding it? I mean, surviving. I mean, thankfully, I haven't had COVID, and, and uh, uh, thankfully, the community here have been safe. My own family and friends have all been safe. Um, so uh, I suppose I'm one of the lucky ones. And, uh, um, yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a concern, all right, but we just have to be careful and do our best. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And and how are you finding, say, the lockdown? Obviously, there's a, a massive adjustment in kind of the pace of life and, you know, kind of things, everything coming to a, a sudden halt. And I suppose you've been vocations director, you're kind of on the move a lot generally. Yeah, yeah. I suppose before the lockdown, I you know, I would have been traveling all over Ireland and meeting people and, and uh, involved in various parish missions and giving retreats and conferences. And, uh, and then with the vocation work, just sitting down with men thinking of the priesthood all over Ireland and uh, yeah it was great I enjoyed it traveling around meeting people doing different things then with the lockdown obviously things have had to slow down and uh, yeah as a, as, a, as a priest it's it's a shame not to be out there administering the sacraments and uh, celebrating mass for people and and uh, hearing confessions all of that um, so we just have to adapt to the times we're living in and and uh, I suppose there's no point in getting too down about it. I mean, we have to be careful as well for other people's health and safety. And at the same time, we just have to adapt to the circumstances and try and preach the gospel uh, in the, the, the times we're living in and try and be a bit more creative and a bit more, um, uh, I suppose, a bit more courageous and trying new things and, and trying to get the word of God out to people in, in new ways. So so it comes to challenges, but also new opportunities. So uh, so it's easy to get down and to complain and 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 to moan about the way things have gone, but I suppose we just have to be positive and and uh, and do our best to adapt to the circumstances and be a little bit patient and hopefully we'll get back to the way things were soon. Well, that's that's it. I think that like for me, I've kind of found that it's it's been good actually the lockdown because um, like I was racing all the time. You know, I was kind of constantly trying to keep up with everything and, uh, you know, work, studies, doing different things that I'm involved in and stuff like that. And uh, and then family and everything like that. But um, I suppose, look, it's it's not an ideal situation, the lockdown, but um, I suppose you have to try and take whatever positives you can from it. And, yeah, yeah. And I think, as you said, it, you know, it, it, it forced us to put things into proper perspective. And, uh, and maybe the way things had gone, we took so much for granted, you know, and uh, everyone was living at such a, a fast pace of life. And all of a sudden, things that we took for granted, you know, even to go out and get a haircut or <laughs> have a cup of coffee with a few friends, uh, all that was taken away from us. And, uh, and I think it, it rattled a lot of people. And also from a spiritual perspective as well, you know, that we took, maybe we took the church for granted as well, that uh, going to mass and having the sacraments so readily available to us, um, all of a sudden we realized that we shouldn't take anything for granted and, um, and to appreciate all the blessings that God has given us, our health, our family, friends, um, and uh, the life that we've all had, um, that we should not take anything for granted, but to receive everything as a gift from the Lord. Yeah, and, and I find even with my prayer life, I would have probably said before, oh, I'm doing so well because I was setting aside some time for prayer in the madness or whatever. And now I have so much more time for prayer and I'm doing more than I was doing, but now I still kind of, I know I, I still could be doing a lot more. Like as in, if I wanted to say, oh, this, this is my prayer life, I could say, oh, yeah, I could promote it as I'm doing so well. But then if I compare it to my Netflix time or to my, you know, all of this kind of thing, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not coming out. Um, it's not coming out on top. So there's, it's still, it's highlighting plenty to me of areas I can improve and, and things like that, you know. Yeah, I think maybe when the lockdown first began, people were glad of the time to spend more time in prayer, maybe do a bit more reading and uh, 
to to go deeper into their faith and uh, and then after a couple of weeks i suppose maybe the novelty of that wore off and people began to feel a bit restless uh, but I suppose perseverance is the key and uh, we have to discipline ourselves in the spiritual life and uh, there'll always be ups and downs and times where we find it easy to pray and, and having the extra time can can work to our advantage and then other times where we feel we've too much and and uh, there are the times it becomes hard to pray and hard to keep focused but uh, but I, I think the, the key is just to keep persevering and um, whatever time we set aside for prayer or whatever time to read more about our faith or to learn more about our faith um that we we give that time regardless of how we feel or what we seem to be getting out of it uh, but just to keep persevering and, uh, and particularly if we do have more time in our hands it seems it seems all the harder to make that time for prayer yeah actually as you mentioned reading there um so i'm part of a book club here in cork uh, which you know about because you were you were at the opening night of it, uh, helping with helping Father Damien with the the setup of it because um, you you have experience of um, I'll let you tell your story of experience of book clubs and how you got into them. Yeah, well, I suppose that particular book club that uh, that started a while back. Um, I actually got the idea when I was out in the states. I spent a couple of years after ordination in in Washington D.C. with the Dominicans there in in in, in the U.S. And uh, while I was in Washington, I came across um, a Catholic men's um, prayer group. And uh, they used to meet every week um, out in the middle of nowhere. This guy had a farm and he had a big barn. And uh, he used to invite all the men from the parish into his barn every, I think it was every Thursday night. And uh, they would all come with their own deck chairs and uh, they'd each bring a cooler of beer or a bottle of whiskey or something. And they would sit down in this guy's bar and it was real rough and ready now. It was a real, um, it was real, you know, it was <laughs> as rough as you could get. But these men would sit there with their, uh, with their deck chairs and their, their can of beer and they would meditate on the scriptures. They'd each bring the missalette for the, uh, for, with, the, with the Sunday readings and uh, they would pray over the... Um, over the readings and then have a discussion about them and uh, kind of a sharing on, on what they what they found in the scriptures and it was an incredible club I was really impressed by them and, and there was men there in their 80s and men who were in their 20s and uh, all sitting there together in a freezing cold barn uh, rough and ready having a, a can of beer or a, a shot of whiskey and smoking a cigar mm. and uh, meditating on the scriptures and uh, they used to call it the, the holy smoke club um, <laughs> And uh, so when I came back to Ireland, I was assigned to the Dominican Friary in Dundalk. And I thought it'd be great to have something like that for, for men to come together and to, to talk about their faith and to, and to share, their, share their faith with, with other men. And I, I thought that was something that's really uh, needed in the church here in Ireland. Um, because normally when you put on something for people, uh, it's easy to get women to come along, but it's hard to get men to sit down and talk together about their faith. Um, so I set up a, a similar idea um, of, a, of a book club. So I didn't go with the idea of meditating on, on the scripture readings every week, uh, but I thought to do something once a month and uh, to choose a, a book each month and um, to bring men together. We'd all read the same book. We'd go off, read the book, come back again a month later and have a talk about it. And, um, and I decided not to do it in a barn or anything like that, but I thought we'd do it in a pub. Yeah. So, um, and the reason for the pub was just, I suppose, an attempt to evangelize the culture. You know, it's, it's kind of easy to put something on in the parish hall or something like that. Um, but I thought, why not bring it out into the culture and have a group of men sitting in a, in a regular pub in Ireland uh, talking about their Catholic faith and sharing it with each other. Um, so we used to call it the In Vino Veritas, um, which, again, is, it's a little bit of a play on the Dominican motto, which is Veritas is the word for truth. And uh, the, which is the Dominican motto, and in vino veritas is a, it's kind of a Latin expression for the the truth comes out in wine. So <laughs> it seemed like a, an appropriate name for a, a Catholic men's book club meeting in a pub. So so that began in Dundalk, and uh, the club took off, and then um, and then Father Damien, Father Morris, the Dominicans in Cork invited me to, down to Cork to uh, give a bit of inspiration, maybe to get a similar club going in in Cork, and um, and that seemed to take off. Thank God. And in the meantime, then I was assigned from Dundalk down to Tala in Dublin. So I set up a similar group in, in, in Dublin and uh, that began almost two years ago and it's gone from strength to strength. And uh, we, we had a pub in Dublin that we used to meet once a month 
Uh, but since the lockdown, obviously, we couldn't do that any longer, but we moved it on to Zoom and we continue to do it. So we meet once a month, the, the fourth Wednesday of every month at half eight, we meet on Zoom and pick a different book each month and a group of guys talking about the book and what they've got out of it. And I always say it's, it's not an academic thing. So it's not that you have to, you know, come up with some kind of deep insight or it's not that you have to study the book in great depth. Uh, sometimes most guys don't even finish the book, but but it's just uh, it's just to get a discussion going really that we've all read something and that we've all put a bit of effort into learning something over the month and then coming together and, and sharing it. And, um, and it, it, it builds great fraternity amongst the guys as well. You know, there's great friendships that have been formed out of it and, and good support for, for Catholic men to meet like-minded guys and, and share their faith with each other. That's great. And is that open to new members all the time? or what It's open to new members, yeah. yeah. Now, I, I normally talk to guys first just to make sure that they're, you know, um, yeah. That they're that they know what they're getting involved in, and uh, so I, I wouldn't really just put out the, the Zoom details at random um, because you wouldn't know who would turn up. Um, but but if anyone wants to get involved, they can certainly get in contact with me, and we are definitely open to uh, inviting new members in. Yeah, well, we'll put your contact details up down uh, after this, or we'll put it in for Spotify and Google Podcasts and iTunes. We'll put it in the details underneath, and with YouTube yeah. and we'll put up your, your details there for anyone who wants to get in contact. Going back to, that was Washington, was it? Yeah, Where, yeah. So, see, what I think is incredible about that now is the men coming together with their, you know, with their beer or whiskey or whatever, and their, their cigars, and, you know, discussing their meditation and the scriptures and, and different things. You see, what I like there now is um, there can be a real separation at times um, we cause it ourselves, but um, between kind of our lives and our prayer lives, you know, and kind of that there, there can just be this little divide and we don't have this crossover. We don't bring our kind of our faith into our lives kind of thing, you know, fully, you know, that kind of way. And I think there's something incredible there. Like, you know, that like I can normally we can be like, oh, I'll pray in private and then I'll go and meet my friends. Yeah. Um, I think there's yeah. something beautiful there. I think that's yeah. I think um, it's kind of part of the secular culture that they're trying to force faith into into kind of a private thing that you do on your own, you know, and that you keep faith out of the out of your your normal life, if we should put it that way, you know. Um, but I mean, that's that's the opposite to, to to the way our faith should be, you know, that our Catholic faith should be uh shining through everything we do our interests our hobbies our, our work our friendships you know our faith should be there as part of it and and sort of um giving life to everything we do and uh, i think that's part of the challenge of the the new evangelization is that that we integrate our faith into our lives and um, that's that's the call of the church but uh but yeah i think it's it's um it's part of the, the secular culture that they try and force christianity into kind of a little private thing and you know you can do it in your own space but don't don't let that influence other people. Whereas we say, no, our faith is, is something to be shared and something that uh, influences everything we do. So, um, and I, I think as Catholics, we need to reclaim that and, and not just uh, keep our faith privately to ourselves, but to, to allow it to permeate everything we do. Yeah, and, and like I say, I'm part of the, the book club now in, in Cork. And um, with that one, we kind of, we meet in, well, it was in a bar of a hotel initially and we're kind of, we're in between venues, um, but it's so because we're on pause at the moment. But um, with with the lockdown, we haven't taken it to Zoom at the moment. But um, I suppose one of the things that really struck me initially was um, speaking openly in a very big group about faith in the middle of a pub, and it was one of those things that if I was ever having a conversation with someone in a restaurant or in a pub or something like that about faith, it was usually you know, almost like a library setting, you know, we'd, we'd speak kind of quietly, waitress comes, you stop talking and, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And this struck me as kind of, here we are openly discussing it. And initially I felt quite self-conscious of it. Yeah. You know, it was, it was and it's a funny thing because you'd be saying, oh no, I'm proud of my faith and it's great to evangelize the culture. But I was kind of like, oh, no, you know, that kind of thing. Or, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a funny one. Um, and, and yet it's as we get into it, you just realize, I think what I, when you mentioned the name of it there, you know, Veritas and, and Truth, it's like, 
so many of our conversations are so superficial and they're just kind of rubbish. <laughs> Whereas, uh, you know, um, like I could spend an hour talking to my friends about fantasy football teams and, you know, kind of nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, Whereas yeah. these conversations, they're really kind of enriching. And like with the with our group, there was there's a lot of older men in the group as well that have great life experiences. And when we're just, it's like you say that it's the kind of the conversations on the books are, they're often a case of like, oh yeah, um, you know, you might, I might have totally missed something. I've read a chapter, but I've totally missed a point in it because I was really struck by another point somewhere else. And I just mentioned that and someone else might have copped it. But then they'll give their life experience or whatever struck them about another. Thing. And just discussing all these things, you come away so enriched from it, you know. Yeah, I was reminded there as you were speaking of, you know, the great um, phrase by St. Thomas Aquinas, where he speaks about how grace builds upon nature, you know, and uh, I think sometimes we think that the, the the supernatural, you know, the spiritual life has to be something separate, you know, um, uh, you know, you have your normal, regular life and then you have your holy life. But uh, but St. Thomas Aquinas says, no, that uh, that grace builds upon what's normal, you know, so it's, it's the, the regular conversations with family and friends and the, the simplicity of life, you know, and despite our weaknesses and our failings and our sins and all that, um, grace builds upon that, you know, so it's not that we have to be perfect and, and uh, be living perfect, pious lives and then we become holy or we grow in holiness, but rather grace builds upon the natural you know and 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 i think you know a bunch of guys just sitting in a pub having a chat and and the same way you would talk about football or talk about movies whatever else um to be talking about the faith and um allow grace to build upon that and and through those friendships and those encounters with other people um sharing the experiences what you've learned um and uh, learning from other people and it, it's it's great if you have a mix of different men from different ages different backgrounds and uh, and yet when they all read the same thing they'll come away with a different experience and, and to learn from that and to you know to grow in your own faith through that yeah it's, it's a very natural thing but there's a grace working there as well grace building up on upon upon nature and it's good to kind of point out as well that it's not like we're studying deep theological books or anything like that that like you know the books are usually ah, maybe less than 300 pages which when you have a month to do it that's 10 pages a day you know yeah, yeah well yeah and like that it depends on the book as well i mean is it father damien does he choose the books with your yeah. group or yeah um, normally when I pick the books for the, the group in Dublin now, I'm, I'm very conscious that, that, first of all, that it's easy to read and, uh, and readable within a month. So you don't want to give something that's too big or too heavy. Um, and, uh, but, and at the same time, you want to find a balance that some people are, have read more than others. So you want to give something that, that's accessible for beginners, but at the same time with enough content in it for people who might, have been, might be well read and read a lot. Um, and also, you know, I try and vary around the topics as well. So we, we don't get overly focused on one aspect of the faith. So we kind of bounce around from maybe something on the sacraments to some area in church history to, to maybe some cultural um, issues. Um, and um, just to, you know, not to get too focused on, on one thing that it's not all about prayer, not all about scripture, but, you know, uh, that we kind of give a comprehensive view of the faith and and some books will click better with other guys than and sometimes people mightn't connect with a particular book or a particular author um but that's fine but we just try and vary it around and try and find something that will will connect with as many people as possible yeah and and actually since since then so you're kind of you're starting a what you've started is kind of starting to spread a little bit because uh, my wife mara then um she's after setting up a book club for women in right. Cork. So, yeah, so so they're meeting on zoom at the moment but normally they're a kind of a once a month to saturday morning to meet for brunch and a, a chat about it like you know and it's uh it sounds good yeah because I, I i mean plenty of women have said it to me you know that they'd like to get involved and uh and I was thinking, should we invite in women? But I, I do think there's something good for men just to talk amongst themselves, you know. Um, but but I would be open to the possibility of maybe starting a, a women's book club or maybe a mixed one. Um, um, but if Mara has one going in Cork, that's that's terrific. Maybe more people could join in on that too. But uh, but I do think it's so important. Um, 
and especially the time we're in now at the moment with lockdown when people maybe do have a bit more time is to have some kind of focus to to read a bit more um um because you know it's so important that we're feeding our minds with with good things you know and and uh, particularly to to learn in our faith and i think this is one of the reasons why people find prayer so difficult is because they don't really read much you know and and uh, their imaginations run dry whereas if we're feeding our minds uh, we're enlivening our imaginations and we're thinking you know we're um you know it, it it makes prayer easier i think um and uh and i think something like a book club which gives you a bit of a focus you know that that uh, there's a bit of direction in what books are, people are reading and uh and everyone is reading the same book so you know that you're going to come together and and share a discussion on it so it kind of keeps people motivated um to 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 read something um but i i do think it's it's very very important for catholics and especially now at the times we're living in and you know we're, we're bombarded with so many distractions we you know we we've netflix and we've phones youtube you know we we so much entertainment on our at the push of a button um and and i like that we can get a lot of good stuff too on on youtube and, and good movies and all of that so i'm not saying it's all bad um but there's a temptation that we just feed our minds with with what we see you know and and uh, and and sometimes we can and things like this podcasts are, are are great it's it's a good way for people to learn more about their faith um so i'm not putting down any of that sort of stuff it's great but at the same time there's something really powerful about breaking away from all technology and sitting down with a book in your hand you know and just having the the words on a page there and and sometimes you have to wrestle with it you know sometimes you have to fight temptation fight distraction and just sit there and and let the words play on your mind and and to soak them in and um and reading's a lot like prayer in that way you know because it's 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 there'll be temptations and distractions and you'll be thinking of 101 things you could be doing and and 101 things that are more important that you should be doing all these distractions come into your mind but i do think as catholics to to form our minds we need to take some time to break away from all the distractions good though they may be and to sit there with the words on a page and uh to engage our minds with them and um and and particularly the scriptures you know to bring the scriptures into into adoration or to sit in the church or even sit at home quietly meditate upon the gospels it's it's so so powerful yeah i agree because i think reading is something that's a kind of um it's it's not that it's dying it's just that i suppose it was probably more common when we didn't have as many distractions and it's something that i think that i've never found any time that I've kind of, I've often found after watching mindless TV, it's different if I sit down to watch a good movie or something like that, and I could have, you know, get something from it or just, you know, good entertainment or, you know, you might find a nice message in a movie or something. But um, it's very rare just from spending an hour or two channel hopping and watching rubbish that I've ever come away and not felt, well, I just wasted the last two hours. But, you know, even if I'm, even if I've read a book I didn't enjoy, I've never felt I wasted hours and hours and hours reading that book. You know, there, there's always, even it's something you didn't enjoy. Like you say, you can wrestle with it. You can figure out what you didn't enjoy about it and you can form your own opinions on things yeah 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 I, I i think you hit the nail on the head there yeah that even if you didn't like it it forces you to question why you know whereas uh when you're watching something on youtube you're 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 been told what to think you know and, and even though you're selecting what you want to watch you're listening to a particular commentator you like and, and we're all guilty of that too you know um uh but but uh but all this stuff then is designed to to rope us in more you know that gives us the prompt for the next clip or the next thing to watch and um and we don't realize it but all this stuff is manipulating us on a deeper level we think we're in control because we're clicking on what we want to see but but yet it's been fed to us you know and um there's there's a huge temptation there and uh and you're right that it doesn't really satisfy you know sometimes you might watch something that you feel okay i'm glad i listened to that or i found that helpful uh but but too much of that stuff you know it, it kind of hollows you out from the inside you just come away sometimes feeling empty and and that you've wasted time and and uh uh, and the internet particularly is just you know endless possibilities you know it's just so many possibilities and and you always think that you're just one hit away from that extra clip that's going to satisfy your entertainment but yes there's another clip that's waiting for you and it just seems to go on and on um but to break away from that and just sit down with a book and um you know think of having a book as as a friend you know um 
Um, I always like to keep books around me and, you know, when you have a good book and, and you finished it and you kind of keep it to the side. And even just when you see the book, you might flick through it again and you, you remember things and, and, uh, and um, it can be, it can be, it's, it's like having a friend with you sometimes. And it doesn't necessarily have to be strictly theology or philosophy. Sometimes you can read a good Catholic novel or, or even, even a good secular book that might have a good Catholic message. It, it can, it can it can help you in your faith you know and and there's a lot of a lot of good catholic fiction writers out there that i always recommend and and encourage people to explore and to, to look into and and one thing i love to do by the way whatever little bit of pocket money i might have um i, I love to buy books and give them to people you know and and uh, and even for gifts or you know christmas presents or um whatever it is i always like to give a book as a gift to someone and um I, I get a little kick out of that when I give a good book to somebody, something that I've enjoyed reading, and then to pass it on to them and, and knowing that they have it. And uh, especially if they read it and they come back and tell me they liked it. <laughs> but even yeah. if they don't, so long as they have it there in their home and, and keep it on their bookshelf, it's, I, I think it's, it's a nice gift to give someone. Yeah, they, no, I, I agree because there's, um, there's a couple of books I've, I kind of really recommend to people uh, from, from a fictional point of view. I love Father Elijah. Um, oh, yeah. I think it's just, and it's it's a big thick book, but it's just it's so hard to put down. You know, it's uh, yeah. yeah for for such a big for such a big thick book, it's probably one that I'd get through far faster than you know some of the other. Ones. It's just the story is so gripping. Fantastic book, and um, another one that I loved, uh, true story, was um, he leaveth me by by Walter Chiswick, Father Walter Chiswick. So uh, I thought that one was incredible uh, a story. And I think that there's huge similarities between that book and um, the lockdown situation we're in, because, you know, he was, uh, he was a priest who went undercover in Russia uh, and then got locked up. He was, he, he was imprisoned for years, suffered horrendously there. But in all that time, I remember the, the, the turning point in the book is when he's in prison and he's kind of like battling the authorities. And it's like, oh, poor me, I'm persecuted. And, you know, they're they're so wrong or whatever. And then he just got this moment of grace where, you know, he just the light bulb went off and he went, hang on, if I'm in this situation, God has me in this situation for some reason. I, he's trying to teach me something and he's starting to learn kind of, you know, how to, how to love, how to, how every tough situation is a teaching moment. And for him to, you know, that it's teaching him something about himself. And I think that through this lockdown, it's a book I've recommended to a lot of people in this lockdown um, is that it, I suppose there's just, we're all there's different weaknesses in us that are coming to the surface now you know it might be patience or you know as a lot of people are struggling with homeschooling kids and working from home and all of these different things and you know patience might be something that's yeah, yeah. you know is well tested you know yeah yeah when saint paul gives his description of love in the first letter to the corinthians his first words are love is patient love is kind you know so he gives yeah. with patience but, uh, but yeah, it's certainly a great little book, all right. Uh, we looked at that in the, the book club a couple of months ago, and uh, yeah, the guys got a lot out of it. They really enjoyed it. Um, but just to echo as well what you said there about Michael D. O'Brien and uh, Father Elijah, if there's anyone listening there and they haven't discovered Michael D. O'Brien and you're looking for a good Catholic fiction writer, um, I think he's one, one of the best out there. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan. In fact, I have all his books here behind me. And uh, uh, I'm, in fact, I'm such a big fan that I've been giving out Michael D. O'Brien books for the last two years. And uh, just before Christmas, I did a whole Zoom session um, um, and I, I spoke uh, on all 13 of his novels and gave a quick synopsis just to kind of introduce people who, who, who might have read some of his books and want to learn which ones, find an idea of which ones they might like to read more or people who never heard of him before. Um, so I, I did a, an hour and a half where I kind of gave a summary of all 13 of his novels yeah. and uh, and I'd certainly encourage people if you haven't come across Michael D. O'Brien to check him out and, um, and begin with Father Elijah. I actually think some of his other books are even better again, um, but that's certainly his most famous book, his most popular one. And um, 
and it's 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 a good one to start with. If you don't like Father yeah. Elijah, you probably won't enjoy the rest. But uh, but I do think some of those other books are even better. Again, I think Father Elijah is one of those books that, as you're as you're reading it, you're like, this would be an incredible movie. It, the whole thing is playing out in front of you. Your mind is just you can picture things so well. It's it's an easy read, but it's just you're picturing yeah yeah yeah, so well yeah. Written, you know I've heard people make that observation all right that it's so well written that you don't have to struggle to imagine what's going on but you can actually you can see the characters it, you can visualize it all taking place it's 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 so well written um i think i think there was talk all right of it's been made into a movie and uh and um i believe that michael o'brien the author himself he 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 came up with some kind of contract that he was allowing it to be used as a movie on condition that they wouldn't undermine the, the Catholic element in it, that he wanted to keep the faith strong in it. Yeah. And, um, and, and fair play to him, he, he made that condition. And, and I think for whatever reason, the movie didn't happen, but, but you know, he stood his ground that he wasn't going to allow it to be made into a movie unless the, um, unless, unless the faith aspect was, was upheld in it, which is, you know, he's, he's, he's a, yeah, I, th I think I read that he wanted approval of whatever scripts, and I think a few have been presented kind of movie scripts for it, but he hasn't approved them simply because, and I can totally understand it. It's his masterpiece. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. Yeah, and a part of me would love to see it being made into a movie because it would reach a wider audience. And then there's another part of me that thinks it's it's such a good book and so well written that obviously, you know, a lot will be lost in, in, in a movie. Um, yeah. So... Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it's just one of those you just have to persevere and read it if you want to get the story. That's true. And and it, it touches again on something that you kind of mentioned earlier um, about books kind of help our prayer life. Because when you're reading that book, everything is you're starting to picture things so well that I think when you go from there and you go to a piece of scripture and you're reading a story, your mind is now attuned to picturing things yeah. and you can experience the scriptures at another level than just you know it's uh, even little things like okay i'm going to say this weekend but by the time this will air it'll be probably last weekend uh in the you know in the gospel you've got jesus's um you know the, our peter's mother-in-law was sick and you know jesus comes and takes by the hand and you know whatever and I suppose like from that side of it, now looking at it, it's like, you know, you're looking at the whole situation. You're like, this is someone, she was unwell, she was struggling, she was suffering. And you're kind of picturing this and it's like Jesus came and rescued her and she serves him. And then you can, you think about that and you start thinking, yeah, I, I was lost there for a few years and you know, he's come and he's, he has, pulled me out of you know the the where I was and you know I kind of go do I drop everything and immediately go and serve him and you know in all that I do and uh, it's that kind of thing it's it's picturing that and you can kind of go on a deep level and it's simply just from reading books and things just taking your mind working in a different way because I think with a book with a book you have to like that you're wrestling with a book, but the entertainment isn't just flashing before your eyes like it is when you sit down to watch TV. You don't have to do anything. The entertainment is just constantly moving in front of you. Whereas with a book, you have to do the work. And, yeah. and I, that's it's great. It takes the prayer life deeper, you know? Yeah, yeah. G.K. Chesterton once said that there's only two things in this life that we never get tired of, stories and people. Um, well, and I, I think he's right, you know, that we, we always like meeting people um and we always like listen to stories you know uh, whenever you meet someone and they say oh you'll never guess what happened to me today you know immediately our attention is gripped we want to hear we like we like a good story yeah. and um and that's how god reveals himself you know um the bible is full of stories you know um and and very human stories uh, ordinary people with you know the bible's full of messy characters you know there's good and bad people and bad and good people and you know uh, and and yet all these different situations and circumstances and and uh, and god revealing himself through through sacred scripture through these stories and uh, and ultimately the bible is is a love story you know it's god's love for humanity and and we're drawn into that story 
and uh, um, and it's, it's like the, the author of the story enters in to the book, you know, um, like Shakespeare writes a story, but he's, he's never a character, but, but God enters into his own story. He, he enters into history, his story, into human history. Mm. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we, we love stories and, and that's how God reveals himself, you know, and, and, and people, I suppose the secular age, we've become so obsessed with, 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 uh, you know, the scientific approach to everything, you know, what can be proved, you know, maths and certainty, science, you know, people uphold science as the answer. And I think this is why the modern age gets so frustrated with the Bible and um, because they want, you know, clear cut answers, you know, uh, when, when Genesis speaks of God creating and, you know six days resting on the seventh uh, you know people get all upset about that you know because they're calculating it and you know uh the, the reading the bible as you know as a scientific book and if, if you take that approach you're just going to run into all kinds of frustration and, and contradiction uh but you have to see the the, the bible as, as as a god as god's story to us and his revealing himself in our way of understanding you know that God is coming down to our level and and showing Himself in in human situations and and Christ, you know, God Himself becoming incarnate and um, and inviting us into that story. So um, so yeah, I mean, God doesn't reveal Himself in a kind of a in in kind of like in an instruction manual, you know, like when you you buy something from IKEA and you get the little sheet with all the you know fitting things together. Uh, that's not how God. Uh, teaches us in the moral life because life is too messy for that you know it's not just a and b and everything connects um but but true stories we enter into it and, and we learn and uh and we learn from other people other experiences and I, I think that's why on a deeper level we find so, stories so interesting and why we find movies so interesting and, and novels and and even stories that our, our friends and family tell us um because we can learn from other people's experiences without having to go through the difficulty ourselves you know if somebody has had a problem or if something awful happens to somebody uh we can learn from that without having to go through that pain ourselves and likewise if someone has good news to tell we we share in their in their joy as well you know that we can participate in their story um so it's all part of how we interact and how we learn from each other and uh, and how god teaches us and i i think that's true there is that that you know the the things that we're drawn to like i just think with interviews the people i am more most drawn to in kind of i, I really like the tommy tiernan show do you know on uh on the, when it's on there because he he listens to people he gets kind of and there's just a wide variety of of people but he he listens to them and really gets to the heart of, of the people but some of the most interesting people are there are people who are kind of artsy and and i suppose by that it's you know it's people who you know they they appreciate poetry they appreciate writing they appreciate different things and it's it it really gives a a fuller kind of person maybe you know that they're not just people who are i don't mean to be giving netflix a hard time or anything like that you know but it's like it's not people who are just binging it's people who are kind of um you know they're they are and and they can experience things at a at a deeper level at a more emotional level and things like that and and i think those people make kind of for great interviews and they're because they're just interesting people and yeah. you know there's a variety then of people and i think when you take that type of thing back to the book club and you look at it and we have a variety of books and there's a variety of writing styles and things like that and then like you say the bible has such a variety of genres in it that once we become kind of more accustomed to reading a, to a total variety of different things, again, take it into the into the scriptures and it just blows it open for us. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're um, when pe I think what you're talking there is, you know, people who are creative, that, that always fascinates us. People who are willing to take risks and try something and people who are willing to, um, you know, as you mentioned, people who are creative with, with maybe writing or, or poetry or art or filmmaking, whatever it is. Uh, also people who are creative with their minds, people who think differently, people who are have a different outlook on things. And, you know, even political commentators, you know, we, we find them interesting if they have a different angle on things. Uh, we're attracted to that sort of uh, creativity. Um, and it doesn't mean that we're all particularly good or, you know, we're not all great artists or great writers or whatever. Um, but but I do think that uh, 
that to be creative is to, you know, to almost share in the life of God, because, you know, God is creative. The Holy Spirit is always creative. You know, he's always active, always doing something. And, um, and, and I think we find that really, really attractive. We're drawn to that. And, um, and I think the more we can lend ourselves to that, regardless of our gifts or talents, it doesn't mean we have to be particularly good artists or whatever, uh, but to have some spark of creativity in us, uh, it, 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 it brings a bit of life into the world. And, and, um, and I think especially for the times we're living in at the moment, when there is so much doom and gloom out there and, and people are stuck at home and fed up and whatever, um, I think it's a challenge for Christians to go out there and, and be creative you know, um, to, to try something and, and to try and bring beauty into the world, um, whatever it may be. As I said, you might be listening to this thinking, well, you know, I'm no good at art and no good at writing, whatever. Uh, but even just something small, uh, writing a letter to a friend or sending a card or, you know, these little things that are uh, little gestures of, of uh, creativity, you know, um, and I think there was a lot of that going on during the lockdown, you know, people learning to bake and you know, uh, improve their homes or paint in the shed or whatever. But uh, but I think doing something with your hands or something creative, um, it, it lifts us out of ourselves. And and uh, it, it's it's um, and I think this is part of the reason Pope Francis called the year of St. Joseph, um, uh, which is something I was hoping to talk to you about, actually, because if, if you read that letter, the apostolic letter that Pope Francis um, gave on the 8th of December last year, calling for the year of St. Joseph, uh, there's a little phrase in there which I really, really love. And uh, he talks about creative courage. And, uh, and I, I love that phrase, creative courage. And you think of St. Joseph, um, that he, he was creative. He was a carpenter. He was making things with his hands. Um, but he was also courageous, you know, and uh, the difficult tasks assigned to him to, to care for the, 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 the Blessed Virgin and, and the baby Jesus and to flee into Egypt and everything, you know, the, the, the challenges set ahead of him. He didn't moan or he didn't complain, uh, but, but he, he was creative and, and he, he took, took responsibility and uh, took charge of the situation. And, um, and I, I think that's why he's such a model for us in these times we're living in and that we can be creative and, and courageous. And uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, to go back to Aquinas again briefly, uh, when he talks about um, beauty and bringing beauty into the world, uh, he he connects it with the the four cardinal virtues, um, and uh, you know the four cardinal virtues. These go way back to the ancient Greek philosophers. You know Aristotle had, had worked this out uh, that uh, prudence, fortitude, uh, justice, and temperance. That these are the four virtues in which all the other virtues hinge upon. That's why they're called the cardinal virtues. The other virtues are hinged upon them, uh, but. St. Thomas talks about beauty in the world and, uh, and he says that if we want to bring beauty, if we want to bring creativity into the world, uh, the two virtues that are needed are, first of all, temperance, um, which kind of makes sense that we have to uh, discipline our appetites and our passions. So we have to learn to cut away from Netflix or at least discipline ourselves that we don't binge watch or, you know, we don't veg out in front of the television, that we, we order our passions because by discipline, discipline and our appetites were we're ordering ourselves towards beauty. We're more open to it. Um, but then the second virtue St. Thomas Aquinas speaks of when he talks about beauty, and I find this very interesting, it's, uh, it's fortitude, what we would call courage. Because to, to enter into beauty to, and to, to, to seek to be creative, uh, well, you have to take risk. You have to step out. You have to try something. You have to be bold and courageous. Um, so, so those two virtues go hand in hand. You have to moderate your, your passions, the virtue of temperance, uh, but then you also need fortitude. You need strength of character um, and uh, the willingness to, to make yourself vulnerable, you know, to try something that may fail, you know, um, but, but to do it and, and try and be a little creative. Uh, it, it involves a certain amount of risk, uh, but we need to be courageous. And, um, and I think that's what, what's needed for the, the times we're living in at the moment, um, to bring a little bit of beauty, a bit of joy into the world and uh, to be um, have creative courage. And of course, I suppose one of the things that with that courage, a lot of the time, I suppose it's 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 fear that stops us, but not just fear. I think that I don't know about everyone else, but for me, pride. And not pride in, because I know we think of pride a lot of the time as being this kind of, um, oh, I'm great. 
you know, and the humble person is the person who's like, oh no, I'm, you know, I'm awful, you know, but, but pride in, in the sense of looking at things as how they affect me, how will I look, how will I, and sometimes I suppose the thing that can stop us from writing that nice letter to someone is, is my pride. Cause it's like, oh no, I, I don't, I don't want to come across as soft or I don't want to, and it's about me. Whereas if we sit down and write the letter and the humility is just stop thinking about me and just thinking about the person who's reading this letter and yeah. just put the words out there for them. And that, I think that's where the humility will allow fortitude to, to flourish. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, maybe the, the writing letter is kind of a silly example, but I'm, I'm just trying to give well, yeah. some very well, big yeah. of an idea. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to what you were saying that that's, I mean, that's why we find creative people so interesting when we see them being interviewed and people who are willing to explain what they did, what they tried and what they were successful at. Um, I suppose we also forget that people try many things and they don't end up on the Tommy Tiernan show or whatever, you know, um, that people do fail at things, but, but, uh, but you know, so what, you know, you, you try to do something and, and bring a little bit of joy into the world, a little bit of beauty and, um, and sure, what about it, you know, and, uh, and whatever it is, um, but I, I think the act of doing it is, is more important than the success or failure, um, yeah. you know, the willing to step outside yourself and, uh, to, to try something, you know, um, to be a little bit creative. It's, 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 um, it's, it's very good for us, or very, and very healthy for us. Another little practical suggestion, which is, which again is, is, is something people don't like to do or try to do, but even just, to, and I, I don't do this myself, but I know it's very good. If you, if you were to sit down and maybe write a journal or, you know, write down your thoughts or um, try and put a bit of shape onto it or, you know, um, I, I have a good friend, he, um, he started writing stories for his children you know he's got two boys and uh and he's trying to explain the catholic faith to them and and you know very various moral principles but he but he does it through true stories you know and uh and and again very clever witty little stories and and uh and he's, he's not trying to do it for fame or fortune or anything like that he's not even publishing them but he just does them for his kids and uh it's just a little act of creative courage to, to try something and and um I think little things like that are, are very helpful and you don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to um, put your work on display for everyone to see, but, but even for, for your own sake, just to, just to try and do something a little bit different and to explore parts of your gifts or talents that may, you may never have thought of or looked at before. And, um, that's, that's beautiful. And I think, you know, the thing there as well is that I, I know I've read before about different um, children's authors, some of the most successful ones, didn't start out writing something for it to be published they yeah. wrote for their kids or something like that because i think that you know like that with a journal if i'm writing a journal um i know like years ago i started this um prayer journal but like i wasn't writing it in an honest way i was writing it kind of going <laughs> wait till this gets discovered after my death and you'll have seen kevin you know whatever <laughs> but like so it's not written from kind of an honest thing whereas you know when when that got burnt and uh you know like when i when i did start kind of just writing you know after prayer different thoughts and different things just writing honestly and writing about things you know different struggles different thoughts and, and different things like that it's it's great to get them out as well and yeah. uh, it's honest and i think like that maybe writing a like a kid's story or something like that we're writing it for our kids as opposed to like oh what will a wider audience think and we're just honest you know yeah. i think that's yeah. i think it's beautiful but I, th I think that's the key really is just honesty and, and trying to be truthful with ourselves and 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 i think that's why we run to again we're picking on netflix here big time but netflix youtube all that sort of stuff i think we 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 run to these things because we run away from ourselves you know we don't want to be left alone with our own thoughts and and our own imaginations um because we're we're afraid of what what we might find but uh, i i think that's part of the discipline of prayer and it's part of the discipline of of spiritual reading uh, it's also part of the discipline of really it comes back to temperance what I was saying St Thomas Aquinas you know exhorts us to be disciplined in our passions so that we can order ourselves towards beauty and, and to be comfortable with, with ourselves and comfortable with our own minds and imaginations and um, and to allow our faith to, to 
permeate our imaginations and how we think and how we how we look at the world. Uh, so rather than just having things feed into our minds, that we have a an obligation to to you know to form our minds in a healthy way, a healthy perspective. Um, yeah. But but it, it, it's it's not easy because we we struggle with ourselves, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, and uh, and I. I, I think they're like even you know as as we mentioned Netflix and giving it a hard time but you know there's nothing wrong with if there's a show you like and you because I think there's a big difference between oh I'd like to watch an episode of such and such a show and sit down and watch it and when you're finished turn the tv off but a lot of the time it's like oh, I just want to fill time so I flick on and I just look and then I find something that clicks and I'll binge and it's just, you know, watching hours of it, just killing time as opposed to, and again, the temperance might be, you know, that, that thing of, I'd love to watch another episode of this, but I'm going to wait till tomorrow for the next episode. Yeah. And, you know, and, and think, cause I think fasting and things like those maybe have, um, sometimes they can get a kind of a negative rap. It's kind of like, it's seen as this doom and gloom kind of a, oh, I must go without this, that or another, as opposed to it's just it's something that's helping us to, you know, it, it's helping our temperance to grow because it's 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 not letting our passions rule us. Yeah, 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 I think so. Um, I think as Aquinas would put it, it's, it's about ordering ourselves towards beauty, mm. um, you know, which is which I think is a good way of looking at it, you know, that uh, it's it's um, it is yeah we, we we tend to look at it in the negative sense of what we're giving up but if you think of it that you're ordering ordering yourself towards something good what's good true and beautiful and uh, that requires discipline it also requires patience patience which we mentioned earlier as well you know that we have to be patient with ourselves too and um and find that balance that we you know we learn uh you know there's always a temptation to go too hard on ourselves and you know just rid ourselves okay i'm never going to watch netflix again and, and you might be good for a week or a month or whatever and then all of a sudden you binge and you crash um you know so you have to learn your your limitations and your weaknesses and and you know maybe you, you do need to give yourself a, a treat every now and again and, and watch a good movie you know um so you know you can't be too hard on yourself you have you know but at the same time we go to the other extreme then when we become too soft on ourselves and you know oh i've had an awful day i'm just going to sit down and watch netflix for two hours or something you know <laughs> so yeah. it's finding finding that balance that that we we discipline ourselves and and yet we're we're, we're forgiven of ourselves as well you know that we're aware of our weaknesses but we're also aware of the i suppose the the, stro the laziness within us as well you know <laughs> Yeah. And actually, as we mentioned books earlier, there's a, a great book um, by Bishop Robert Barron. I think at the time he was Father Robert Barron, but um, it's called Seeds of the Word. And um, it's just it's going through different cultural things, books, movies, things. And it's um, it's kind of looking at them to see that there are seeds of the word kind of of, of their seeds of faith scattered right throughout culture and for us to see it so it's sometimes in in just a, a movie you know we might there's just there's great little seeds and we can start reading the book kind of trains you to see these things everywhere so when you are watching a movie you kind of and it's not necessarily a christian movie or whatever it's just a hollywood movie but you can start seeing the true the beauty just little elements of it you know it, it might be a father giving up you know a father giving up their life for a child you know or something like that you know and it's kind of like or someone giving their life for another or something like that and you kind of start seeing when someone's given their life for someone else you kind of say well hang on this heroic situation we're all we're all looking at this thinking wow look at this character like what he's doing is amazing and then we start seeing wait where why do we see this as being amazing we see it because it is amazing jesus did it and you know and it's and now we're blown away by some fictional character doing it in a movie and mm. whereas it really happened for us you know and 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 that kind of thing and it's so that's that's a great little book and i think like that even that it's that even helps to tune which movies we watch and and ones we don't because we start to see which ones actually you can start to see which ones kind of feed you you know and nourish you and things like that yeah, yeah. I suppose we 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 see elements of truth in 
everything, you know, um, no matter what you watch or read or look at, you, you'll find something true in it. Um, and then you'll also find maybe things that are distorted, you know, um, the truth gone wrong. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, just trying to unravel that. And, and uh, but, but, you know, everything comes back to Christ, you know, who is the way, the truth and the life. And uh, I mean, the gospels are the greatest story ever told, you know, um, because they teach, teach us everything. And, mm. and I think, you know, going back to what you were saying there, there earlier about the more we allow the, the stories that we read in the gospels, the, the, the different events, the more we allow them to fill our imaginations, the more they become part of our daily lives. You know, we realize that what we read in the gospels, uh, it happened 2000 years ago, but it's not just history. You know, that, uh, that the very fact that God became man, that, you know, he who is eternal stepped into our world of time and space. Uh, you know, God is outside time. So what we read in the scriptures is not just ancient history, but, but continues to happen. So they are in the historical account of the life of Christ. I'm not denying that, uh, but they're more than that. Um, yeah. They're that and more. And um, that, that God is... Uh, everything we read it's you know god is the eternal now uh you know always new the holy spirit is as i said he's always creative he's always at work and uh and when we can allow our faith to um become real in that sense that we we see it um we see it in our imaginations we see it unfolding in the drama of our lives when we make that connection then our, i think our faith really becomes alive and and uh we, we get that passion then for for what we believe and and uh, to allow it to infiltrate into the into the wider culture so i think that's the challenge and and for 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 catholics today is to really allow our faith to become living realities you know uh yeah. not just reflecting back on what happened years ago but but what's happening now yeah yeah, seeing these things playing out in our lives, you know, I, I even think I'm just looking at a painting there of the um, it's just painting over on the wall here. And it's just a painting of the calming of the storm. And, you know, I just anytime I think of that, I'm always just I'm looking at that and I'm just thinking of, you know, that's not just one story thousands of years ago, two thousand years ago. That that's a story of every storm I found myself in. You know, yeah. it's like I have acted, you know, it's like as if. Jesus is asleep or he's not there and I'm struggling with this thing, but it's just, you know, he is there. Just, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, a good, it's, it's a good point you bring up to about art, you know, that when you have, I think I, this is why as Catholics, you know, we love statues and art and painting and everything and why we decorate our churches and cathedrals with, you know, beautiful stained glass windows and everything is because, um, you know, when we surround ourselves with art, we surround ourselves with beauty and, uh, and a good work of art is something that, you know, every time we look at it, we 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 see something new, or it, it, it changes us in some way. You know, so it's not just you you flick through something in a magazine and you, you discard it, but by putting up a a piece of art that that you know that you really like, it, it draws you into the into the mystery, and uh, and I think that it's so important for for Catholics that we do keep up you know images of the the Sacred Heart or or statues of Our Lady or you know, whatever, or a particular scene that you like, the Carmen of the Storm, whatever, but if there's some event or some picture, some image, some statue that, that you connect with, you know, surround yourself with these things and, and, uh, and you know, they, they, they seep into us. It doesn't mean every time you pass by it, you're going to stop and go into a meditation, but, uh, but, but surrounding ourselves by these things, they, they seep into us. And, and, uh, and I think that's why as Catholics, you know, we've always venerated statues and holy pictures and, and, um, and you know even music and all of these things you know that they're that they fill our soul and 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 they enrich us from within and and inspire our imaginations and and uh, and the modern age is all about dumbing down and minimalism and doing away with everything and you know ugly buildings and you know everything's reduced to the to the bare minimum um, but uh, as Catholics we shouldn't be afraid of of surrounding ourselves with with beauty and art and um and I think the reason why the you know the, the postmodern culture is, is 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 tends to dumb down everything and construct ugly buildings and so forth. I, I think we're afraid of beauty. You know, we're afraid to surround ourselves with with with, with beautiful things because they 
they, they, they get at our, at our conscience, you know, they make us think. You think back to the Middle Ages, you know, and, and people, when, when the faith was alive and permeating the culture and people would build extraordinary cathedrals and compose magnificent music and works of art and everything. Um, and, and, you know, people just had this awareness of, of God around them all the time. Uh, whereas now we're, we're running away from all that, you know, we're, we're terrified of, of, of beauty because I think we're afraid to think, we're, we're afraid to... We're afraid to connect with that because it, it speaks to us at, at, a, at a deeper level. That's true. And if you think like if we're afraid to look at beauty in art form or, you know, if, if we're afraid to kind of to connect with it in art form, um, it will be all the more hard to to connect with the true beauty of God. You know that because we'll be afraid and we'll we'll run from that if we can't connect with with these things because you know it's i suppose with with art as well what i like about it is um and i'm by no means you know kind of <laughs> someone who knows anything about art but i don't, but I don't know I, a lot about it myself either so i'm, I'm kind yeah, of no, but i think like what's what i like about it is um you know sitting now watching tv or a movie right and um we're even kind of subtly the the producer the director whatever they're telling us what to think they're telling us who to like who not to like it's very very rare you'll find someone who'll say i actually really like the villain in that movie and i didn't like the hero you know it's like we're we're told exactly who to like who not to like what i kind of um I found, I, I remember one time in, in Dublin, just went into the National Art Gallery. I was killing time. I was waiting for someone. They were running late. And uh, I was walking around and I was so, um, I was so used to this fast paced life, you know, that I was just kind of like walking around going, no, 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 no. And just like, I'd say like five, 10 minutes, I was back out the door and I was like, yeah, I've seen it. Whereas, you know, then kind of as, as things kind of slow down, kind of grown face and things I can now look at a picture and kind of go mm, I don't know I don't even know what I think of it and then I kind of go and that's what I like I like to just sit down then and go I don't know why what I think but I know I'm drawn to it I don't know do I like it do I not like it and I just like to kind of think about it and go why am I drawn to it? and those kind of things and I think that's it's it's again it just makes us think and I think that's that's the beauty of those things, art, books, things like that. They're just, they're great to make us think. Yeah, yeah. And maybe if we could just bring in, bring it all back to prayer again, I think this is why the, the rosary is so important because uh, when we meditate upon the mysteries of, of the rosary, we're, we're contemplating all these events in the life of Christ and, uh, you know, through our imagination, we're, we're projecting them up onto, onto the screen within our minds. You know, we're thinking of these events um, but we're also allowing them to seep into into our into the present moment, and uh, you know when you think of the prayers we say when we when we pr pray the Rosary, we the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and the Glory be, and all these prayers are about the now. You know, if you think of the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, you know, it's not about give us the bread for tomorrow. It's it's give us this day our daily bread. So we're praying for the for, for each day. You know, each each moment. Uh, likewise, when we pray the Hail Mary. Uh, pray for us now and at the hour of our death you know and um, I mean they're the only two moments in time that we're certain of the present moment and someday we'll depart this earth and please God be ready for heaven so we ask our lady to intercede for us now and at the hour of our death uh, we don't ask to pray for what happened in the past or we don't pray for what might happen tomorrow but uh, now and at the hour of our death and, and then glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit as was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen so we're contemplating the, the events in the life of Christ and bringing them into the now, into our own situation. And we're, I suppose, merging in the, um, you know, we're, we're fusing together um, the mystery of God into the, into the mess of our own lives. You know, whatever, whatever is going on, whatever difficulties we're praying for, whatever intentions we have, or whatever prayers of thanksgiving we might be making, that every time we pray the rosary, we're, we're, we're bringing the events of the life of Christ in union with Our Lady into our into our present situation. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. And actually, when you say about those two times, I suppose, you know, there's there's huge anxiety out there in the world today. Um, and and you know, I suppose a lot of 
a lot of it is fear of the future. It's it's worrying about things that are not now. You know, it's worrying about possibilities so often. It's worrying about what if this happens? What if that happens? And it, it's worrying about the future. And it's it's very rare that we're actually on a sinking ship kind of going, get me out of this situation now. <laughs> like, you know, it's uh, it's so often it's like, we're just probably on a ship and kind of going, oh, what if it sinks? <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Like, and, uh, and yeah, I think that like that, that there's a beauty in being present in the present moment because if we're constantly thinking about the future, we won't be present even in conversations. We won't be present. And I think we kind of see that when, you know, I, I can be very guilty of, I go and say, if I meet a friend and I'm sitting and, so I'm having a conversation with, it could be, I could be having a conversation with my wife, Mara, and I won't be present in that conversation because I'm texting my friend to arrange to meet him for coffee tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And tomorrow I go and I meet him. But yeah. when I'm, think, I'm probably texting Mara, do you know what I mean? Yeah. About, about will I get something in the shop on the way home? Without, because we're constantly thinking ahead as opposed to just being present where yeah. we are. Yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, and again, I think the uh, the age of technology is fueling all that. And again, not to go too hard on these things. It's handy to have mobile phones and, and internet access, all that. Uh, but it does um, distract us away from the present because, uh, you know, we're, we're, our minds are just racing ahead to what may or may not happen. Um, I, I mean, I think that's part of the human condition, regardless, regardless of technology. You know, there's always a temptation to be looking ahead. Um, and as well, for some people, the, the temptation is to be looking in the past you know um yeah. living in the past uh i suppose we're all a bit guilty of both of those extremes um but um but i do think that the present age when there's so many distractions um it, it takes us away from the present moment and and we deliberately have to make a, a point of cutting away from everything and just being in the now and and again back to temperance you know maybe there's, there's ways we can discipline ourselves to moderate our distractions uh you know if, if we do meet a friend for a cup of coffee we'll leave the the phone in the car or at home or whatever and um you know we're not going to <laughs> we always have temptation that we we feel that well i better bring it just in case there's an emergency but really, yeah you know if you're meeting know, I, for, for 10 minutes 15 minutes whatever i mean um, yeah I, I think it was last was it lent last year or lent the year before my wife maura she um she said, I'm just taking the Google app off my phone for Lent. And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't think any. And then it was only at that I started realizing how often I go to it or whatever. And she realized that she wasn't charging her phone as often. Um, she was more present in conversations. She was, you know, all these different things because you're just not drawn to Googling something or whatever. And it's it's like that, I suppose. That's kind of the temperance part of it, you know, that it, it helps us to grow that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we've been conditioned to think that we're, we've become so dependent on these things that we think we can't do without them. And we, we forget that the human race has been in existence for thousands of years without mobile phones and all these gadgets. And, and uh, you know, people survived, you know, so uh, to meet someone for half an hour and leave the mobile phone in, in the glove compartment of the car or leave it at home, whatever. I mean, the world survives and and i think it in, it enriches our friendships if we can sit down and just talk to someone without the phone ringing you know um, and actually you you mentioned um saint joseph there and i'm i'm just thinking could you imagine living in a house with our lady and jesus well first of all you'd be well aware of your shortcomings but um but i mean if, if you're living constantly uh like that i mean you're it's like perpetual adoration with Jesus in the house. And it's, you know, it, it's, you know, you've got Mary, Mediatrics of Grace is living in the house. I mean, how could you not be present, you know, in, in life, um, in, in, in the moment? And, um, you know, you've mentioned about this year as being the year of, of St. Joseph and how it's a, a timely time for that. Um, would you like to kind of expand a little bit on 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 the year of it and and yeah sure yeah um 
Well, every Sunday night I have a, a group that meet on Zoom. Uh, it's, it's a thing I started with the Legion of Mary. Uh, back when the lockdown first began last March, a group of us came together on a Sunday night and um, we just came together to talk, a few friends. And, um, and I can't remember exactly how it started, but somebody had a, a theological question and uh, they asked me about some, something within the church, some church teaching. And uh, I ended up going on a rant for half an hour or something like that. And, uh, and as I said, it was just kind of a casual discussion amongst a few friends on Zoom. But, uh, but somebody made the comment, you know, that they never really get a chance to sit down and talk to a priest about theological questions or whatever. Um, so we thought, fair enough. So we, we meet back again the, the following Sunday and, um, and have a, a, a discussion. And uh, it began to grow. People started tuning in then on a Sunday night. We'd invite in more people and uh, we'd begin with the rosary and then just a few questions on the faith. And I would try and answer them as best I can. And uh, we... we we called it a uh, flunk the monk, a little bit like, you know, the, the flunk the friar that the, the U2000 group do. Um, so it, it just began to, to grow over the weeks and we kept it going throughout the, throughout the lockdown. And uh, I suppose to cut a long story short, we, we, we renamed it as Sunday Rosary and Ramblings. So it's no longer called Flunk the Monk, but uh, we call it Sunday Rosary and Ramblings. And uh, it's, it's an open invitation to anyone who wants to come in at nine o'clock on a Sunday night and uh, as I said, we begin with the rosary and then I'll give a little 20 minute presentation on some aspect of the faith. And then it's an open discussion for half an hour or so. So the whole thing lasts about an hour and a half. And um, and the numbers have grown on average. Now we get 150 people, I think, on a Sunday night. And uh, wow. and if anyone out there would like to come in, you're more than welcome. We'll, we'll maybe post up the, the Zoom details or something like that. And, and how many can you facilitate? Uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Uh, ah, we'll we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we've we've never hit the target anyway, so yeah, yeah. I don't think people have ever been left waiting to get in. So, uh, yeah. so uh, so we pick a different topic, but it's the same Zoom details each week, and uh, we normally do up a little flyer each week and send it out to people. So we have a mailing list too. And um, how, how can people get on that? Um, well, I suppose if they wanted to email me, um, I, I can give my email address, and if people want to contact me, I, I'd be happy to add them to our mailing list and. Uh, um, and we can let them know about it. I also saw the flyers on, so we'll we'll get in further to vocation side of things later. But mm. you have the website. Is it Irish Dominican Vocations? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I put up the little flyers on the. It's uh, www.irishdominicanvocations.com. Dot com. Perfect. Irish yeah. Dominican vocations .com. yeah, and the little flyer for Sunday Rosary and Ramblings goes up on that. So, um, but uh, it is the same Zoom details each Sunday. So even if people don't get the flyer and they, if they have the, the code, they can tap in any Sunday. But but we would we would like to people to receive the little flyer. So by all means, if they can get in contact with us, we can add them to our mailing list or check on that website, Irish Dominican vocations .com, and you'll see them advertised there. Um, sorry, all of that is a long way of getting around to St. Joseph because uh, uh, well, two, three weeks ago, um, the topic for our Sunday Rosary and Ramblings was uh, the year of St. Joseph and why it's so important. And out of that discussion, uh, we came up with the idea of doing the 33 day consecration to St. Joseph on Zoom. Um, a lot of people had mentioned that they were preparing to do it and uh, would like to do it. So I put together a, a group that will um, we will pray it every day for 33 days, beginning on the 15th of February, uh, to conclude on the feast day of St. Joseph on the 19th of March. And the idea is that at 8 p.m. every day for those 33 days, we'll pray Pope Francis's prayer for St. Joseph and we'll do the daily readings, the meditations in preparation for the 33 day consecration. And then we'll conclude with the prayer for vocations through the intercession of St. Joseph. So it's a way for people to come together in a online praying community and uh, to do the consecration together um, while also keeping that particular intention of vocations as well through the intercession of St. Joseph. Now, so we've used kind of um, some big words, kind of overthink words that can uh, frighten people. Like I know the word, when you mentioned about the Sunday ramblings there, uh, theological questions, things like that. And I know someone might go, oh, no, I." I can't go into so, like theology that's so deep that's what but like 
theology is the study of God. So the, the, the questions are not like, it's not like professors coming along and like asking you questions. The questions are just questions that are designed for us all to learn more yeah. and things that people don't understand or they want to find out more about or something. Yeah, no, it's, it's all very relaxed. And the idea is it's, it's Sunday night. I mean, it's begins at nine o'clock, goes on to half 10 on a Sunday night. So it's, 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 uh, I suppose it's just a way of, of, uh, counteracting the TV culture. You know, I'm sure most people on a Sunday night just relax in front of the TV. And we thought, why not do something that's, um, that's not too heavy, um, but yet maybe informative and, um, and, and even the theological questions, you're right. It's, I mean, sometimes it's, it's more of a, a chat and a discussion and, and, you know, people just have comments that they want to make or ideas that they want to share. And, and uh, um, so it's, it's by no means heavy. It's, 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 you know, very down to earth and very, uh, very informal and relaxed. And, and um, yeah, as we'd say down and awfully a bit of ground hurling, you know, so it's, it's, <laughs> I think no I think I think that's lovely and I think you know Sunday being the Lord's Day you know we start at Mass but often when we get out of Mass it kind of slips away from in the Lord's Day and more of a day off and a day for sport and a day for whatever so it's, it's nice to finish it again you know with with yeah, yeah. it just seemed like a, a nice way on a, on a Sunday night just for as I said it started just amongst a group of friends on a Sunday night coming together to talk about the faith and, and then it just grew and grew and uh and at this stage, 150 people on average. Some some days it's a bit more, some days it's a bit less. Um, but um, but there's a consistent crew that are there every Sunday, and and uh, and a uh, few regular faces, and it's 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 a nice thing to be part of. And and we always encourage people as well to keep their um, keep their cameras on, you know, even though they might be on mute, so there's not too much background noise. But we encourage people to keep their cameras on if they can. Not everyone does, of course. Um, but but it just builds a sort of sense of community that you you know you can see everyone there in their different homes and you know it's, it's something uh there's something nice about it um so it's not just yeah, looking at that car down yeah. yeah yeah and especially if people do want to make a comment or ask a question that you know that everyone can see them and and uh, it's 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 a way of building up some kind of community despite the the lockdown around us you know and and to remind people that that there are people out there around Ireland and 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 indeed around the world people actually come in from the US and Canada and even Australia and uh, there's one man comes in from Nigeria I mean I don't know how they hear about it but but anyway they they come in and and uh, and and sometimes that can be very interesting too I mean a couple of weeks ago uh, for example. Uh, the topic for our discussion was um, Pope John Paul II's visit to Ireland and uh, the warnings that he gave and did we listen. So I, I went through the different homilies that Pope John Paul II gave in 1979 and picked out different warnings that he was um, looking at in, in Irish society and, and, you know, some very profound insights he had. It's, it's amazing uh, if anyone goes back online and reads those homilies to, to see what John Paul could see happening in Ireland in 1979. But, uh, but anyway, we, we, did, we had a good discussion on that. And it was particularly interesting when the, the American people spoke, you know, the American people who were joining in on the discussion and their perspective of Irish Catholicism and, and, and uh, what they had to say about how they could see Ireland changing over the past past 40 years or so um so it's 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 interesting you know to have people coming in from different places around the world and and uh yeah it's it's uh it, that's beautiful so again like that anyone that is watching or listening to this kind of from around the world it's a it's a an open invitation so yeah absolutely yeah yeah and, and, so, and if I could just mention one other thing, Kevin, if you don't mind, uh, a similar yeah. thing we do on, on a Friday night, again at nine o'clock on Friday, um, we have uh, what we call Fridays with Frank. And uh, this is based on the, the writings of the servant, servant of God, Frank Duff, who was the, the founder of the Legion of Mary and, uh, and an extraordinary man, really. And, and uh, he's written numerous essays and articles that have been published over the years. And... Um, every Friday night we come together to discuss a different one of his essays. Um, so, and, and like that, we can send them out to people in advance if people want to read them beforehand. And, um, and then there's a panel of us that, that discuss the, the essay and then we open it up for discussion. 
So um, so that's every Friday night at nine o'clock, Fridays with Frank, um, particularly if you're interested in, in the Legion of Mary and and uh, and the writings of Frank Duff. Uh, but even if you're not, even if you've never heard of Frank Duff or the Legion of Mary, uh, he's an extraordinary mind. And, um, and I've been in the Legion for nearly 20 years now. And I remember when I first joined the Legion, I read a lot of Frank Duff. And then I kind of parked him aside for a bit. Um, but I, I'm only coming back to him now and really discovering just what a great mind he had. And, and uh, uh, as a layman, he'd have, you know, really, really profound way of 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 um, looking at human psychology and how people think and how people interact and uh, and merging in the faith with that as well. So it's it's very practical stuff with very rich theology. So his essays are really extraordinary and and quite profound. So um, so that's something we that just began a couple of weeks ago and it seems to be seems to be blown too. People seem to enjoy it. That's Friday nights, and again, we can put the. So what we'll do is we'll put your email address and people can people can just email you and ask if they just want to push in the in the title of the email um just kind of mailing address or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, I mean or if they want to specify if they're interested in the Sunday night, not the Friday session, or or if they want both, whatever, uh there's no problem at all. I'd be happy to or even if they even if they just want further information or if they if they don't know what, what I'm talking about here, they just want some more clarification. Um yeah, no, by all means anyone can contact me on my email and and uh, I'd be happy to respond to anyone with whatever queries they have or whatever way that they'd like to get involved. Everyone is welcome. That's great. And uh, so we'll, I want to come back to Frank Duff and the Legion in a minute. But before we do, we've just started talking about the St. Joseph consecration. And when I was saying about some of the big words like theological questions or whatever, consecration is another word that I know I've mentioned before that there's um, the 33 day uh, one to consecration to Our Lady. And now you know, lately, over the last year, the St. Joseph one has become quite popular and uh, it's been promoted a bit. And um, I suppose I, I mentioned someone before and they asked, like, said, what's consecration and why would you do it? And I was like, uh, and I couldn't put the words. So I let you answer. Well, the first thing I'd say is that the consecration to St. Joseph goes hand in hand with the consecration to Our Lady. Because, I mean, who's the first person to practice true devotion to our Blessed Lady? Well, it was St. Joseph, um, you know, and, and I think a lot of people are very familiar with the, um, the consecration to Our Lady, particularly St. Louis Mary de Montfort's uh, preparation and consecration that he's outlined. And that's been practiced by numerous saints, the likes of Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Padre Pio, uh, and even some of the, you know, the Irish people. I mentioned the Legion of Mary, you know, the founder of Frank Duff. Uh, the whole Legion of Mary was founded upon the spirituality of St. Louis Mary de Montfort and the consecration to Our Lady. And that was practiced also by the likes of Edel Quinn, Alfie Lamb, uh, even Irish people that were not members of the Legion of Mary, such as Matt Talbot, you know, huge, huge devotees to um, to this idea of consecrating yourself to Our Blessed Lady. And um, and the idea is that you you make an act of, of self-giving to, to Our Blessed Lady um, and uh, you consecrate yourself to her that all you you give you give to her uh, that she will pass it on to Jesus, um, and uh, and I think the the consecration to Saint Joseph is is a leading into that, or it kind of works in union with that. That you're 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 immersing yourself into the into the Holy Family, the life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, and uh, by doing this thirty three day consecration, you're you know we have set readings that are laid out that you you learn more about Saint Joseph and his 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 virtues that you can imitate them that you can become more like him um and that you you um you form your spirituality modeled on on his so it, it's this i suppose an, an act of spiritual union i suppose you could put it that way um and an act of self gift of yourself to joseph and mary all and it's not you know it's worth pointing out because i've i've seen different commentaries online about different things and uh you know it's people often kind of say, well, why not just go straight to Jesus? But, you know, I think one of the beautiful things is, um, well, these were the two people who were closest to Jesus. Mm. And, um, you know, they like when I think of my little son, Michael, now, you know, and I mean, we're more and I are the two closest people to him where, you know, we're there. And not only are we 
forming him he's forming us you know it's it's this constant little thing where you know he's he's teaching us so much you know and and little things and um it's I, I suppose about ourselves and whatever but you know we are this and we I'm not cutting out my daughter Mary Jane either but she's uh, you know she's four months old so and again that's teaching me things about myself and, and things like that as well but you know I suppose as when we look at the family unit um and we that's where we're so close and um again you know if jesus was part of this family unit then through mary and joseph we can draw closer to jesus than than we can on our own yeah absolutely yeah i mean it, it goes back to the the mystery we were talking about earlier about how uh you know the extraordinary thing of the incarnation that god himself uh, stepped into our world and was was born of a woman, you know, and into a into a, a human family, Mary and Joseph, and uh, this idea of grace building upon nature, you know, that uh, that uh, that our faith is very natural, and 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 God reveals Himself uh, on our terms, in in our way that we can understand, that we can comprehend, and uh, and and this is the beauty of the Catholic faith is that uh, that. It, it's such a, a, miracle, a miracle that we can't get our heads around and yet it's so close to us it's so ordinary to us and you, you think of Jesus with Mary and Joseph for, for 30 years and we're not told in the gospels of what went on you know uh, I mean the only event that we're told of the, the early life of Christ after he was born and presented in the temple uh, we're told one incident in the gospel of Luke where he went missing at 12 years of age and was found after three days in the temple um, and then we're told that he went with Mary and Joseph and was obedient until them, obedient to them. And we don't hear anything else until the baptism in the, in the Jordan, um, which we're told happened when he was about 30 years of age. Again, we're told that in the Gospel of, of Luke. So we've those what they call the hidden years of Christ. And um, and it's not that the the evangelists, you know, forgot to tell us or that they, you know, that they didn't know what happened. I, I think it's 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 I think that's the Holy Spirit teaching us, you know, that it's drawn us into this mystery. You know, it's it's not the it's not the absence of information, but it's it's a teaching in itself, you know, the ordinariness, the simplicity, um, that when Jesus did go about his public ministry, you know, the local people thought, sure, we know him, sure, he's he's the son of the carpenter. Uh, it all just seemed so ordinary that they couldn't get their heads around it that this was God in their midst, you know, and um, and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uses a, a great term, which I, I always find very helpful. He talks about um, how it was fitting that Jesus should be born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know. Um, you know, people will say, well, why, why can't God just save the world with a click of a, you know, uh, I'm trying to say click, click of his fingers. Uh, you know, why, why doesn't God just, just make everything okay? Um, but God reveals in, himself in a way that, that's fitting for us what's natural for us, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that the power of God uh, reveals himself in a way that we can understand. You know, this is the, the mystery of the, of the incarnation, that God humbled himself to be born of a little baby, uh, something so ordinary and so familiar to us, something so ordinary and so familiar that we, 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 we almost miss it, you know? It, we, we almost take it for granted, the extraordinary thing that's happening um, and how ordinary and simple and everyday it is. Uh, and, and yet God saw this as a fitting way to reveal himself to us because it, it connects with us on such a profound level, you know. And, and this is why images of going back to art and beauty and, and why uh, images of Our Lady with the baby Jesus is, is so powerful. And, and, and the most, I, I think it's, it's the most um, painted image in, in human history. It's, it's the one thing that all the great artists always strive to, to capture. You know, they all, all the great artists always, you know, painted the Madonna and the child and all the great composers always wrote music about Our Lady and the child uh, because there's a, a, something so powerful and so, uh, so deep about it and yet something so ordinary and so human as well um, that here is the, the, the mystery of God uh, in the arms of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary and, and uh, it, it's so fitting for us in our human condition and, and yet it, it's, it's something it's so powerful as well that this is God himself speaking to us in, in, in our terms and in a way that draws us into the mystery and, uh, and I think going back to the idea of the consecration then it's, it's just a way of us to uh, in, enrich our faith and to enliven, enliven our faith and our devotion um, you know a consecration is not a it's not a legal contract or anything like that it's not it's not bound by any vows or anything but it, it's more an act of love really that we can expand our hearts to, to, to accept that love on a deeper level and, and learn from the saints 
you yeah, know, learn by their example, you know, to, to meditate upon their, their, what they went through and, uh, and to, to learn from them and, and to, to be inspired by their example and, and to imitate their virtues and, and, uh, to be formed in, uh, to be formed in their, I hate to say to be formed in their spirituality, that doesn't really sound right, but to be, uh, to, to have our spiritual lives enriched by, uh, by the power of their example. And yeah. Then. That's yeah, that's beautiful because I, and it, you know, it requires a, a humility as well, you know, to kind of be able to say, no, look, you know, obviously, you know, we can't do everything on our own, you know, but that takes a humility to admit it, you know, as well. And, and to, to seek help. And I think as men, often we don't like to seek help, yeah. you know, in, in not just, uh, you know, not talk about spiritual life, but in, in things in general, we don't like to seek help. Mm. And, um, I think it's 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 good for us to be able to kind of say, yeah, you know what, I can actually ask another man for help. <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, yeah. So and um, and uh, again, I saw a, a question before saying if I've already done the consecration to uh, Mary, does that mean I can't do the one to Joseph or whatever? But no, absolutely, you can. Absolutely. Yeah, they go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so that's um, sometimes that's our, sometimes, uh, sometimes people kind of think that the saints are in competition against each other, you know, or that. Yeah, you won't start any spousal rivalry in heaven or anything like that, you know, between Jesus, or between Joseph and Mary. But, no, uh, no, my advice is to get all the graces you can and whatever, you know, whatever help you need. Yeah. So that's starting on in on March or on, on February the February the 15th. 15th okay and we'll put up what we'll do is we'll put a, a flyer on you have a flyer on that we'll put that on our facebook page okay. and we'll put it on our instagram page and um also it'll be part of your mailing list sure yeah we have i mean if anyone wants to contact me about that too that's that's no problem yeah, yeah. that's great and um yeah and if anyone wants to contact you about all of the things you can just put it in one email sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and again, just to point out the the website www.irishdominicanvocations.com. Okay, and so before I get to Legion of Mary and Frank Duff, um, you have just mentioned Irish Dominican vocations, and you are the vocations director now. Obviously, things are very different for you at the moment because you can't get out and meet the same men and stuff like that. But men. At this time, when everything is slowed down, men might find themselves um, probably maybe thinking. They might have more time to think about different questions. Um, you know, there's uh, it's it's a huge time for kind of reevaluating and things like that. And someone might be considering um, that they might, maybe even the slower pace of life might actually make them hear a call um, towards the uh, the priesthood and towards the Dominicans. So if that is the case, you are the man to contact. And uh, just because you can't get out does not mean the Dominicans will not be taking people in. So they... Uh, you're no, still well, yeah, always happy to hear from people. And uh, yeah, and if, if, if there's anyone out there who is thinking of the priesthood or wants to learn more about Dominicans, I encourage them to just get in contact sooner rather than later. And um, and even if it's just a vague curiosity, well, why not just give me a shout and we could just talk about it. And um, and yeah, even throughout the lockdown, plenty of guys have been getting in touch and some are following through and some are thinking and, you know, people people come and go all the time and, and I'm well used to that. And, and whatever stage of discernment you might be at, uh, don't hesitate to give me a call. And um, I think sometimes people are afraid that if they make a call to a vocations director, well, then they're already labelled, you know, <laughs> there's no turning back. Uh, but no, no, I mean, there's many, many steps to go before there's any talk of even applying, you know, so, uh, um, so no, the sooner you can get in contact, the better. And uh, there are plenty of things that have been organising for people who are interested in, in vocations. Uh, for example, every Thursday, um, I print together a group of guys um, on Zoom. And uh, again, everything's on Zoom these days. But um, but every Thursday night, I have a, an introduction to Dominican friars and talk about the Dominican life. 
and I, I invite in a different Dominican um, to talk each Thursday night um, on various aspects of the life and different ministries people are involved in and uh, a particular emphasis on the formation you know to, to meet the brothers who are going through their studies for the priesthood and um, so at present we have four men who just began the novitiate last September they're down in St Mary's in Cork and we have nine student brothers who are in training for the priesthood in St Saviour's Priory in Dublin so um, so I invite these young men who are in formation for the priesthood to come in on Zoom and talk to the to to, to any to, to, to the group of guys who are at various stages of discernment. As I said, some guys are keen on applying, other guys are just having a, a curious look, but uh, but give me a call anyway and I can let you know more about those details and and you'd be very, very welcome to even just talk about it. That's great. And um, again, it'll be the same same email address. Yeah.